Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Hello everyone, I'm Nurul Helmi Rizkianti from group 10 as the moderator and in this meeting uh, we are gonna bring transcendentalism in poetry as the material and in this group we are have three members there is Nurul Azizatul Husna Nurul Hirmi Rizkianti and Selma Kamili Hamida and in this meeting we are gonna bring some material the first is concept of the union between nature or macrocosm and the individual or microcosm the second is self-reliance and self self exploration to nature and the third the concept of living in simplicity next is the difference between romantic and transcendentalism next is transcendentalism talk in poetry and next human expression and individual uniqueness and the last is nature is the worthiest resource for the poet's power and the first material is gonna explain is gonna explain by myself okay mm, concept of the union between nature or macrocosm and the individual or microcosm nature is used as a study or science and also as an inspiration for self-development the union between the eternal or divine nuances or we can take the example of nature where the nature itself is God's eternal creation and we are gonna discuss about the union between the eternal the eternal or divine nuances or the nature and the human soul understanding the world or nature with intuition or heart that when the heart is when the heart is not move to understand this world then this world can be integrated with our soul and change will never occur sensitivity of heart or intuition relate to the world or nature which will have a greater influence on change in this world or nature that's why transcendentalism is very visionary as if it can predict future even because of its intuitive sensitivity that has been trained to understand this world this concept is similar to the concept of Sufism in Islam especially related to the unification of self and God that the individual or human soul can unite with God Okay, the next material is self-reliance and self-exploration to nature. Self-reliance is that we have to rely on ourselves to change something because logic and limited sensory knowledge and intuition can produce deeper and lasting knowledge because it is the soul that can hear whatever is in this world. Emerson considers genius not because of his mind but because of his intuition and an individual who can listen to his private heart. He who has the override himself and his soul, if his heart say yes, then that's the answer he get and self-exploration self in my opinion is when we know our own ability and then we try to understand the world or nature with the ability of our intuition or private heart so that we can become one with nature and hear the voice of our own private heart okay maybe that's uh, enough that I can explain uh, the next material we explain by Nurul Aizatul Husna and Selma Kamili Hamida 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh My name is Sama Kamila Hamida uh, This time I will explain about the concept of looping in simplicity uh, You know this group is discussing about transcendentalism So I read the chapter about transcendentalism in poetry And I found uh, something interesting that may be uh, related to uh, living in simplicity So here's the uh, a little uh, quote that I take from page 216 that says like this So the poet's habit of living should be set on a key so low that the common influences should be like him His cheerfulness should be the gift of the sunlight, the air should satisfy his inspiration, and he should be tipsy by water So the poet uh, intention in oh so the poet uh, uh, living should be simple as that because in uh, in transcendentalism is uh, between about between human and nature. So uh, the simplicity in it is just uh, how human and nature become one because uh, transcendentalism is. Uh, using uh, nature as the subject, not just as a useful subject, but it's searching for a deeper meaning, like uh, maybe almost has a spiritual aspect in it. So the simplicity in it, just uh, the simplicity in transcendentalism is just uh, the, re- the relationship between humanity and nature. Like uh, this is the poet uh cheerfulness should the gift of the sunlight like uh the sunlight uh gives uh his light to the poet so the poet can uh waste his mood and the air surface for his inspiration like uh, uh the uh the air like make the poet calm so uh, it can uh give poet more inspiration and he should be tipsy by water not like uh, wine or something uh, so just simple as that and then the next sentence is, is that spirit which suffers quiet hearts which seems to comfort to such from every dry knoll of the grass from every fine stump and hot embedded stone on which the dual march sun shines comes forth to the poor and hungry and such as are of simple taste so uh, the the spirit the poet spirit that uh, using nature has is uh, simple inspiration is just yeah it looks like uh, just uh, usual nature uh, plain nature but if you uh, look at it again more deeply is just has more uh, more deep meaning that like a hidden meaning uh, so uh, uh, the living in simplicity in transcendentalism is just as simple as that like uh, just how uh, human and nature become one maybe that's uh, the explan- explanation for me Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh My name is Nurul Azizatul Khusna and I would like to discuss the next material it is the difference between romantic and transcendentalism so romantic and transcendentalism are almost similar and arguably there is no difference what distinguishes a little from them is that transcendentalist ideas are more facing the side of spiritualism than what our sense see. If it is romantic, even if it's an expression from the heart, from feelings, but still the triggering comes from objects or nature. For transcendentalist, this word is no longer seen as an object, but part of a union. So for the next matter is about transcendentalist thought in poetry. 
He is isolated among his contemporaries by church and by his art, but with this consolation in his pursuits that they will drive all men sooner or later. For all men live by truth and stand in need of expression, in love, in art, in avarice, in labor, in games, we study to utter our painful secret. The man is only himself, the other half is his expression. Man basically has half of himself, the other half is his expression. In the end, a good, a good human being is one who can balance himself and his expression. Notwithstanding this necessity to be published, adequate expression is rare. I know not how it is that we need an interpreter, but the great majority of men seem to be minors who have not yet come into possession of their own or myths who cannot report the conversation they had they have had with nature. There is no man who does not anticipate a super sensual utility in the sun and stars, earth and water. This stand and way to render him a peculiar surface, but there is some obstruction or some excess of polygam in our constitution, which does not suffer them to yield the due effect. To touch should thrill, every man should be so much an artist that he could report in conversation what had befallen him. Basically, the human being has become an artist for himself, for what he already has within himself, and inside a human being should be able to carry out conversation with his heart, with nature, with fellows that with with values that he believes to be true. So the next material is human expression as individual uniqueness. The poet is the sayer, the namer, and represents beauty. He is a sovereign and stands on the center. For the world is not painted or adorned, but is from the beginning beautiful. God has not made some, made some beautiful things, but beauty is the creator of the universe. Therefore, the poet is not any permissive authentic, but is emperor in his own right. Criticism is infested with a kind of materialism, which assumes that manual skill and activity is the first merit of all men, and disparages such as say and do not. Overlooking the fact that some men, namely poets, are natural sayers, send into the world to the end of expression and confounds them with those who prevents its action but, not, but who quiet it to imitate the sayers. It is the poet who finally has natural expression because he is able to do things that ordinary people cannot do. Dialogue with nature is an effort to maximize one's potential. Seeing nature is no longer as an object, the work of God, but seeing nature is a beauty. Whatever nature presents is a beauty. Basically, human has become an artist for themselves, for what they already has in them, and humans should be able to have conversation with their heart, with themselves, with nature, with values that they believe to be true, and in fact, not all humans can do that. The poet is ultimately the one who has this power. So this is what makes a human expression as a individual uniqueness. And last is, nature is the worthiest resources for the poet's power. What kind of poet can produce good poetry? The condition can be found uh, in the sentence that Emerson said on page 233. Wherever snow falls, or water flows, or birds fly, wherever day and night meet in twilight, wherever the blue heaven is hung by the clouds or sown with the stars, wherever are formed with transparent boundaries, 
whatever are outlets into celestial space, whatever is danger, and awe, and love, there is beauty, plentiful as rain, said Poti. And though thou should walk the world over, thou shalt not be able to find condition in no fortune or ignoble. Uh, from the quotes above, it can be concluded that by interacting with nature and recognizing it as a unit, uh, and in nature there are two values or more spiritual values that can make human happy. Any small natural object must have value, and that makes nature the worthiest resources for the poet's power. And that's it. And that's all for me. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.